Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. This is Steve coming to you from Conway, Arkansas, and we're joined this week by Caleb Ontiveros. Caleb created an app called Stoa. Uh, it combines mindfulness, meditation, and stoicism, and I highly recommend you check it out. On this episode, he'll discuss that app, he'll discuss meditation and his favorite stoic practices, as well as tips on creating habits, using social media as a stoic, and more. So I hope you'll join in and check it out, and uh, once again, email the show at sundaystoic at gmail.com if you have any comments or questions. Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Today's guest is Caleb Ontiveros. Caleb, welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Uh, Caleb is the... Uh, creator of the app known as Stoa. And uh, I don't know if you've checked it out yet, but it's a an excellent app combining uh, Stoic philosophy and uh, mindfulness meditation, among other things. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it in, in a little bit. Uh, Caleb, you've also been writing a lot of online articles about Stoicism. Uh, is, is that mostly been through the, um, uh, uh, is it Medium where the most of those have been posted? Yeah, I've been, done um, quite a bit of writing for Donald Robertson's publication on Medium, um, and then I've also written a post for Modern Stoicism on Stoicism and Meditation. Excellent. Well, we'll put all of that yep. in the show notes. So tell us a bit about yourself. How, Who are you, and how did you find your way into this, this crazy camp of Stoicism? Yeah, so I studied philosophy um, in undergrad and grad school. And I stumbled upon Epictetus first. I read the handbook and I thought it was, I thought it was interesting at the time, um, but it didn't really stick with me. Um, and then that, that was an undergrad. And then in graduate school, I was leafing through a book by Nassim Taleb, who is a trader philosopher type. It's called Anti-Fragile. And I really like the notion of anti-fragility. Um, and Taleb talks quite a bit about Seneca in particular. So I went back uh, to read Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. Um, and that's when it really, it, you know, it really struck me at that point in time. Sometimes you can read things at particular points in your life and they might not stick. And I think that was the, that was the first case for me with stoicism, but what, revisiting stoicism in graduate school was like exceptionally powerful uh, for me. Uh, so, you know, I yeah, did that through sometimes mes- hearing the message when you're receptive to it is uh, very important. I think I I may have encountered a bit of stoicism in high school Latin class, but it it didn't speak to me at the time. Probably because I was working too hard on conjugating my my verbs and things. But uh, running into it when I had just become a father and was very stressed out, <laughs> it, <laughs> some of it really spoke to me then. So I could I could see that. Now, if I remember right, looking at your Twitter feed, you said uh, PhD dropout. Uh, is, is that how you worded it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what I said. <laughs> so how do you make that decision? That's a good question. So I think that I decided to go to grad school because I, at that point in my life, I saw myself only as becoming an academic. You know, I had the view that um, there's no other things that I would find meaningful or satisfying except to study um, philosophy. Um, and I, over the first few years of grad school, I realized that view of myself was mistaken um, and that there were other activities that I found quite meaningful. And then there were parts of academia that I didn't find as meaningful as I anticipated. Um, so... In particular, I was frustrated by the rate of feedback one gets on one's work and the sense that it's quite difficult to um, make an impact. Um, in particular, one is needs to specialize in a particular field um, quite quickly, um, and that, that can feel a little bit constraining. 
you know, the thought is for a lot of academics, I think that they'll take the constraints until they get the PhD, and then they'll take a few more constraints until they get tenure. Then after they get tenure, then they'll be free to <laughs> work on whatever they like. Um, and I think that over, I realized that that wasn't really a trade-off I wanted to make. Um, so I decided to um, learn how to program and came out to the Bay Area um, and started programming. Um, and I found that to be, you know, quite enjoyable. The, the feedback process there is quite a bit faster. Okay. And then you decided to combine your love of philosophy and, well, I don't know if you have a love of programming or, or, or not, but you're, you, you do like philosophy. I understand you apply it to your life and now you've decided to build a platform that uh, you can share to the world. Could you tell us a bit how that came into, into being? Yeah. So I have um, been meditating um, for quite some time and enjoy using a number of different meditation apps, um, but realize that I would really like to use an app that combined the philosophy of meditation and stoicism. Um, and, you know, it occurred to me that, you know, I didn't know anyone else in the world who would make it apart from me. So, you know, <laughs> I might, might as well, might as well get going. Right. Um, and I do enjoy programming. You know, I get to build a mobile app, um, which uh, feels great um, to you know notice the you know the quick output of a few lines of code on one's phone uh, and watch other people use it as well. Um, and yeah, so I guess the idea was basically the idea germinated from the thought that oh, this is something I wish existed, um, and that you know I was, I was in a pretty good position to to make it. Yeah, having having the. Uh... The inspiration and the know-how, uh, and then being able to watch it come to life must be rewarding. Um, ha has it been fairly popular? Yeah, so uh, there are quite a few uh, users, um, which is quite exciting. And it's good to hear feedback um, mm -hmm. about you know people from uh, who are either just encountering stoicism, just encountering meditation, or find that they. You know, we're both familiar with meditation and stoicism, but really like the combination of how it works together. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the meditation side of things. So um, could you explain a little bit about what mindfulness meditation is for the listeners and then uh, a, a bit about how it's applied and then the benefits you've experienced from from incorporating that into your life? Yeah, absolutely. So I would define mindfulness as non-judgmental awareness, um, this ability to see things as they are without adding unnecessary value judgments to them. And what one does in meditation is to try to cultivate this attitude. So you will do something like sit, um, do so intentionally, you know, think about why you are sitting, what you'd like to come out of the session and commit to following through. And then during the body of the meditation, you will focus on something like the breath, just watching it come in and out and notice how you might become distracted. And instead of feeling judgments about, say, becoming distracted or judgments about particular sensations you notice in the body or judgments about, you know, oh, you know, plans you might have in the future, this sort of thing. You note that those things are happening, you note those thoughts, and then return your attention to the meditation object, in this case, the breath. And through this you know, repeated practice, one can get better at remaining in these states of non-judgmental awareness and also training yourself to notice maybe when you've become distracted uh, and then returning to the present moment. So can that... For ex example, when you're you're coding, can you use that to keep yourself from wandering off and coming back to the task at hand? I think so. So in coding in particular, I have noticed that occasionally, you know, one might, um, you know, I need to install particular different, you know, packages in order to get something to work. And I might realize, oh, so I'll use this package that's this specific version and then realize, oh, I've broken <laughs> another another package. So I need to change <laughs> that version number. And then realize, oh, no, that broke something else. And this type of process can be quite frustrating. Um, and I think this is where my meditation practice is quite useful. So 
if you, you know, I could become more and more frustrated, in which case I might think less clearly, become more impatient, make uh, less uh, good decisions. But if I simply notice the frustration, notice that it's there, um, and then re return to the task at hand, that is often a lot, a lot more useful. And when I've been able to do that, um, things turn out much better. What are um, the uh, common pitfalls, do you think, for people just starting out with mindfulness meditation? Yeah, that's a good question. I've noticed that some people might stop too soon. Um, I think some people have tried it and for a few minutes found that it was strange and then decided to quit. Um, and I think something that um, is underneath that sort of judgment is an expectation that, oh, things need to be a certain way when I meditate. Or um, if I don't have a sense of stillness after the first few minutes of meditating, things might uh, be, I might be doing something wrong or the practice isn't working. Um, so I suppose the, probably the most common pitfall is a sense of expectation about the practice and what it will lead to. Um, and those sorts of expectations can get in the way. You know, what you're trying to build is just a non-judgmental awareness of how things are um, using you know, the stoic language, you're trying to recognize, you know, what's under your control and what's not. And for things that are not under your control, um, just seeing them as they are without additional uh, value judgments. And you, if someone might come to a practice and make particular, uh, and just, just have some assumptions about how, how things must go perfectly or something like this, right, right. Which, which isn't quite, quite what the, the practice is all about. Instead of, you know, the assumption that oh, things must go perfectly, it's about maybe removing that expectation and just seeing things as they are. So you kind of alluded to this already, then how, how do you see that uh, technique, mindfulness meditation and, and stoicism integrating? Um, where are the overlaps and, and how do they uh, benefit each other? Yeah, so I think a key way in which they integrate is on the idea, this idea of the dichotomy of control, this, um, you know, I'm sure quite familiar to a number of listeners, this idea that it's important to be vigilant about recognizing what is under your control and what is not. And for those things that are not under your control, being able to accept them as they are and, you know, return to your thought and action uh, that is under your control. And meditation is quite useful for that, both building the sense of presence being able, which you need in order to be vigilant, um, and also for being able to accept what is not under your control. I know I, I could use that today. I've been grading uh, part of the academic side of things that is not too oh, yes. glamorous. And I have students that are going to present a poster soon. And there are some of them that's like, I don't want anyone to see this poster in public yet. I need now I need to help you rewrite it, and and uh, I start to get frustrated, and uh, need to just step back and say, one step at a time. This is a solvable problem. Don't look at the totality. Look at what you need to do right now, <laughs> and don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> I think that's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do at the moment. Yeah, that makes sense. I think this idea of you know, not looking at the totality and just looking at oh, what's this next step that I need to do is is very useful. Uh, what's the you know the next thing that is under my control? What then uh, are your are the uh, stoic practices that you uh, find the most useful in your life? This might be a roundabout way of answering the question, but sure. another way in which um, stoicism and meditation are quite useful is um, for preventing this cognitive fusion, which is this idea that sometimes our beliefs about the world becomes fused with what we think, uh, you know, the world re reality and our beliefs get fused. So an example of this is if I find myself um, going back to the programming, programming example, mm -hmm. 
being frustrated, I might, I might feel angry. And if I'm working with a colleague, I might, you know, blame the, this colleague's code or something like this. It's like, oh, you know, objective feature of the world that this, that this uh, colleague is blameworthy. And, you know, I am the just engineer who writes perfectly clean code and this sort of thing. And this just becomes a feature of the world that, you know, maybe something's unfair or someone is like deeply blameworthy as opposed to, um, mean recognizing that, oh, I have a belief about the world and then there's just the world and that, um, my, those things are separate. Um, you know, Marcus Aurelius has a line about, you know, if you've been told that so-and-so has been talking behind your back, then that's what have, you've been told. You haven't been told that someone's done wrong to you or something like this. And I think that, you know, this idea of being able to recognize when your thoughts have been fused um, has been um, exceptionally useful for me in a number of areas. First, you know, practical, um, you know, cases where I'm working with others and this uh, sort of thing, like the the coding example is, of course, a real example. <laughs> um, um, but also when dealing with, um, you know, depression at earlier points in my life, uh, I think I'm thinking through n- noticing that oh, my beliefs about particular things are, uh, those are, they're just beliefs. That's not the, the world is not, um, identical to, um, those beliefs and those, these, these are just thoughts and they might not always be true. And I think with something like depression, it's easy to get in these loops where you tell yourself this story all the time and you start just accepting it and it starts to run over and over again and being able to wedge something in there and evaluate it and say, wait a minute, is this way of thinking really productive? Is it, am I really objectively assessing my situation or am I just falling into a pattern of thinking that isn't very healthy? Uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think you can do that through, um, you know, conceptually thinking about what the belief is and then people like to do this through journaling or mm -hmm. through, you know, conversation, or you can also take, what I think of as maybe a, a, you know, the non-conceptual route, which is maybe meditation and and noticing, oh, these, these thoughts I'm having are distinct from the world and maybe being able to break this, this, these sort of negative thought patterns um, from building on top of one one another by getting distance from them. So if someone downloads your app, uh, the, the Stoa, it's called Stoa. Um, Yes, exactly. Um, what uh what what sort of features will they have on there to help them begin this uh fusion of of uh meditation and stoicism yeah so the i suppose there are three main features one is you uh journal um and the journal is connected to different stoic quotes so you can view a particular stoic quotes or prompts and begin journaling from there um and then you can there's also a section of quotes um that people can leaf through um, star their favorites and this sort of thing. And then the primary body of the app is in the meditation sections. So there are a number of different guided exercises, um, introducing these, uh, you know, stoic ideas and ideas like cognitive fusion, um, and, um, focusing on the disciplines of stoicism, the discipline of desire, discipline of judgment, discipline of action. And through there, it starts through different mindfulness type practices. Um, one can also build to other stoic practices like the view from above or premeditatio malorum, um, and particular gratitude exercises as well. So, you know, essentially you have a number of different features and on the meditation track, you have an introduction to stoicism with a number of different stoic and meditation techniques. You don't have to pay to, to, to utilize the app. Uh, but you can subscribe for more features. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's, um, you have a initial free trial. Um, and then after that trial, you, um, uh, you know, it's great to subscribe if you, if you enjoy, if you want to continue listening to the meditations, Mm -hmm. uh, you're fantastic. uh, Um, if you subscribe, um, then there's a yearly and a monthly option. Um, Caleb's got to eat people. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to pay rent. <laughs> I, I live in the Bay Area, um, and but the journal um, and quotes and the introductory uh, meditations are um, those are all free. So mm-hmm. you know what you're subscribing to are the additional meditations um, and new ones um, that that we're uploading.
So do you yourself uh, consider those uh, the three uh, major topics of Stoicism from the uh, Epictetus perspective of uh, – um, uh, you, ju- you just mentioned them a moment ago, the uh, – I'm um, sorry, my, I had a long day of teaching today. My brain's a little oh, yeah. fuzzy. <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah t- teaching and grading can do that. Absolutely. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. But but we have action and, and uh, uh, for example, and judgment. Yeah, desire and judgment. And, yeah. And, uh, d- desire. Um, do you find those to be three big pillars that you attempt to incorporate into your actual activity? Yeah, I think so. I, I, so um, I think about those as the, th- the three pillars and – I think that there are, you know, a number of ways in which I try to apply some of those ideas to my life. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing project. Um, but you know, one, one example of thinking about the discipline of desire, which is mostly, you know, concerned with relegating your desires to what is under your control or not is I notice, um, as I work on Stoa that it's easy for me to, continually check download numbers or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I might see, you know, and if I am on a good, if it's a good day, then I'm, you know, qu- oh, you know, quite happy. You know, I, I've checked, keep, I've checked it a few times. The number goes, keeps, keep on going up. That, that feels great. Um, but if it's, you know, maybe not such a good day, then it might be you know, frustrating to continuously check uh, things like this. Um, and it's a good reminder to stop at, you know, I, you know, I've stopped that sort of activity because, you know, I can't control whether someone is downloading my app right now. You know, what is under my control is, uh, you know, what, you know, the, the lines of code that, I'm supposed, that I would like to be writing or what I'm writing and this sort of thing. And of um, course, uh, we, we apply our judgments to these things like, oh, having more downloads is, is good. Well, of course, you know, it's, it's preferred, right? Uh, it's something you prefer yes. to have, uh, but I, in the same way, you know, oh, I, I have a new patron. Yay. Oh, I lost a patron. No, no. What's wrong? What did I do? Oh, you know, you could, you could snowball on you if you're not, if you're not careful. But, uh, we live in a complex world with a lot of interacting variables and, mm-hmm. and getting all upset over a, another download or a new, new patron or a fewer, one fewer or whatever is probably not worth, uh, losing our sanity over, uh, if we can help it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think there's a similar pattern with social media where a number of people might be, you know, they might think, oh, I got a number of new followers, or I lost a few followers, so I got a number of likes uh, and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the, the point about stepping back and asking, oh, is it, you know, there's a question about how does one deal with you know, rapidly changing down to numbers, patrons and so forth. Mm-hmm. And how does one think about whether that's under one's control or not? But there's also the question about, you know, what's actually valuable. Uh, and, and is it the number of downloads, the, the kind of thing that I actually want to, um, you know, maximize over my life. Right. And, and so maybe, maybe that's not quite it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you're on your deathbed, you'd be like, I got it. This many downloads, my life was complete. Yeah, that that we're, we're this is too much of a new thing to have uh, old time wisdom based on. You know, Seneca di- didn't say anything about downloads and uh, and a complete life. But I think we could draw some parallels between uh, uh, superficial uh, success in the past and 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 superficial success now. Uh, how do you feel about social media? Stoicism and mindfulness have a lot to say about how does one use social media well. Um, And I think there is, you know, there's a point about what what we touched on earlier about thinking about, you know, what is under one's control and maybe how to think about followers being followed or likes and this sort of thing as, you know, probably not the sort of thing you want to optimize. And also noticing that there are a lot, you know, the social media platforms have a lot of things inbuilt to make you want to, to maximize those things and um, taking a breath and, you know, stepping back from um, falling into um, that, 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 you know, there's what's really a bit of a trap um, is quite valuable and thinking about, okay, you know, what do I actually value in my life? Um, 
you know, how does how is social media build, building my character or something like this mm-hmm. um, can also help you step back um, from those parts of the platform. Yeah, um, I found it can be parts of it can be very helpful, like uh, being part of a global stoic community to ask a few questions or to get some advice. But but there are there are definitely pitfalls and they having a purpose for your social media use is quite useful. If you mm-hmm. have if you go and, you know, as a default user, then there's a decent amount of chance that you might be um fall into some of the less healthy patterns. But if you think, oh, you know, what I want to do is stay in touch with family, then do things on social media that help you stay in touch with family. Um, Don't, you know, uh, spend time playing particular games or, you know, uh, getting in arguments with, you know, friends you may have had from high school or something like this. Uh, You know, this, uh, and I think, the one especially useful thing about social media you mentioned earlier is that there are quite a few very uh, fantastic online communities um, that you can join. So um, joining like the Stoic community on Twitter or Facebook. Um, but having can... having an intentional use for, mm-hmm. for, for your social media rather than let's see where my mouse randomly clicks today. Uh, uh, let's see where I end up. You know, that may yeah, be the yeah. most healthy way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that seems right. Um, and I think I think also people are um, not fast enough to block or mute people on social media. Oh, I've gotten very uh, good at that. Is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is something that is okay to do. Uh, and, you know, in a way, you're sort of cultivating your own your own garden, you know, mm-hmm. what, what you pay attention to. And um, I have a lot of family members that want to tell me all about their political beliefs and things. It's like, I don't need to know. I might agree. I might disagree, but I don't need to know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, one, uh, recent article that you worked, uh, that you uh, put out there that I, I thought was really useful and, and I'd like you to talk a bit about because, uh, I know I've been guilty of this and, but, but being able to catch it, I guess, is part of the, part of the importance, but then what to do about it. And that's the consumption of stoic material versus actual practice. Yeah, sure. So I, in that article, I note that, um, you know, this is a pattern I've noticed in myself before, um, is that, you know, I might find a, you know, fantastic new stoic article or, something like this, and I might read it, and I think, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I think maybe I'll I'll apply it to my life. But before um, thinking about how to, like, actually sitting down and thinking about how am I going to apply this to my life, I might get distracted by some other activities, and then this cycle might repeat where I find another book I enjoy or another article (laughs) or something like that. So, like, oh, these ideas are brilliant. But um, one really does need to be intentional about sitting down and thinking about, okay, now, now how will I apply these ideas to my life, you know, whether it, um, you know, how is, is there a new habit that I'd like to build? How, how will I actually do this? And, um, being quite specific and concrete about coming up with a plan it is absolutely, you know, absolutely necessary. Um, one thing I noted in that article was that, um, one thing you can do if you'd like to say, change a particular habit is you know, hold yourself accountable or raise the stakes a little bit. So, you know, commit to a friend that oh, I'm not, you know, maybe you notice you're using social media too much. So like, I'm not going to use social media for um, a week. And, you know, if you notice me um, online at any point, uh, I'll pay you, you know, $20 or, you know, <laughs> right. or whatever, you know, this is this, this one example. Um, uh, and if you notice yourself thinking, oh, maybe I actually don't want to pay $20 in order to stop using social media, that can also be like quite useful to clarify um, your goals and how much you clarify, uh, or how much you value, um, something, uh, of that sort. What, one thing that reminds me, uh, uh, I have, uh, an app that, uh, was called Alarmy. It worked for me well, uh, when I was having this issue, you take a picture of something on the other side of your house and your alarm on your phone won't shut off until you take a picture of that item again. So, you can't shut it off manually unless you get out of bed, go across the house, take a picture, and then you're up. So you've accomplished your goal, hopefully, unless you just go back to bed. I, I can't control that. But uh, <laughs> but those ways of concretely inserting something that will actually cause a change in behavior mm-hmm. rather than just going, oh, that's cool. 
and then wandering off and, <laughs> and not implementing it. That's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Alarm is a good example. I think it, it'll also there's also a mode where you can answer math questions. Oh, that's right. And you yeah, answer yeah, a, yeah. a number oh. of math questions before you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what works for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah but, but yeah, so I used it. I used that for example because I thought I want to be able to get up at this time to have a little more calm in my morning, and uh, this makes me do it. Um, how are how do you set up new habits? What are your techniques? Yeah, good question. I think that um, I use I do use monetization. And I think it is quite valuable for thinking about how much I value the new habit as well. Um, so that helps me clarify that question. Um, I'll use a tool called Beeminder, um, which is um, okay. a habit tracking uh, tool that allows you to stake money on whether you follow through. Um, and I think in general, I if I'm setting up a new habit, I want to make it easy as possible for me to do. Um, I want to make it um, attractive. Uh, let me like incentivize my behavior in a particular way. And uh, I'd also, you know, would like the feedback loop to be pretty pretty short because you know right. humans, uh, we care a lot. You know, if we get the reward right away, um, so. Um, a example of this would be, um, let's see, what's a recent habit I have tried to build? I think that, um, let's see. So for running, I like to run a particular amount of time a week, and I have a goal in Beeminder mm -hmm. that oh, I need to run at least three times a particular week. I'll use an app called Strava that where you can watch how much other people have run and also <laughs> record your own runs. There's a little bit of social right, pressure right. there. And it's also, you know, it, it's gamified a little bit. So, you know, that, that feels good. It feels good to upload a, you know, a run and then let's see that, Oh, someone has congratulated, uh, you know, you for doing that. Um, that is, uh, a small reward. And then thinking about specifically like, okay, when am I actually going to run? Uh, and for me, that's you know, a time in the typically in the afternoon that I find uh, most, you know, the easiest time uh, to run and then making it easy for me to get dressed, leave the house uh, and um, yeah, have that all set up. Yeah, th I think there's there's an excellent book on this by um, James Clear called Atomic Habits. Uh, that has he has a pretty good framework for how to think how to think about habits. So, so maybe I'll, I'll just I'll give a shout out to him because his work is uh, pretty good. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I know the uh, idea of making it as easy for you to accomplish the goal as possible. Uh, having a, I think having a def really well defined goal is important as well. Uh, something that's not too vague. Like I am going to be more fit. Okay, what does that mean? Like what what are you actually going to how are you going to measure that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think um, this, all, this ties actually quite nicely to the idea of dichotomy of control and the dichotomy of control forces you to be a little bit more precise, you know, is mm -hmm. being fit something you can take an immediate action and like achieve the outcome. You know, you are now fit after you have done that one specific action. <laughs> no. Right. Uh, instead, you know, it's, a, you know, you need to be, it, you know, forces you to think about, okay, now what is under my control? Maybe it's, going to the gym at a specific time, uh, you know, for a specific duration and doing, you know, a particular amount of exercises. Um, mm -hmm. Pin it down. How am I going to, what am I going to do? And then how am I going to do it and say, okay, that means set the alarm at five 30 and then have the app to get me up. And then off we go. I, that's how I got myself to go from not running to, I just do like five K distances, but, uh, uh, I used to not run at all. So uh, I think habits are possible do, uh, with these practices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, is there any anything else you'd like to tell the uh, the listeners about? How can they uh, – anything else you're working on or how they can uh, follow you on social media or, or uh, check out anything else you've written or done? Sure. So I write um, on Medium uh, weekly. Um, and Donald Robertson has had a nice publication called uh, Philosophy as a Way of Life. Um, and there are a number of other authors like himself, uh, Massimo Piccolucci, who writes um, on that publication. And then I am on Twitter, if Twitter is your 
thing. Uh, it's my Caleb M. Ontiveros. Um, and then yeah, you can find Stoa at Stoa, S-T-O-A, meditation.com, stoameditation.com. And that's available on, uh, I know it's available on Android because that's what I have, but also iPhone, yes, yes, I think. Yes, yes. So you can right? also look it up in the App Store by searching Stoa uh, or the Play Store. Great. Absolutely. I highly recommend everybody check it out. It uh, seems to be a very useful app and seems to be growing all the time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we've added new content. Um, just started working with Massimo Piccolucci as well. Um, uh, so yeah, it's exciting stuff. Great. Well, Caleb, thanks for joining the show today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right, Carpe Diem. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. Bye.